appreciate it. If you got your Bibles, turn to Oh Lord, Romans Book of Romans chapter 1 We're going to read two verses verses 16 and 17. Now, I'm not a preacher, as you well know. I'm a teacher. We're going to learn a few things here. We're going to take our time, slow and easy, and it'll work out great. I'm sorry, what chapter did you say? Chapter 1, Romans, verse 16 and 17. And I made a comment a little while ago that I was told around 11 o'clock today that I would be teaching tonight. Usually I'm told a week ahead of time, okay? <laughs> so that I'm ready to make sure that I prepare. But Chuck knows that I've always got something somewhere. So it doesn't really matter. We're going to read two verses first, and then we're going to go back, make a few comments, ask a few questions. And please be willing to participate, because if you're not, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to call you. <laughs> and see, and remember, there's no wrong answers. The idea of teaching is to see how much people know about either Christianity, Christ, salvation, the gospel, as Christians, we should know a whole bunch. For whatever reason, we might not. But Paul here is speaking in the book of Romans. He wrote 13 out of the 27, 29. How many gospels are there? Anybody know? The Gospels of Jesus Christ. How many Gospels are they? No answers? Only four. How many books in the New Testament? 27. So he, he wrote 13 out of 27 books. Okay? So that ought to tell you something about Paul and the use that God or the job that God gave him to do. So let's look at verse 16 and 17. This is Paul talking. He's talking to the church or writing a letter. When you see these books, they're really letters that were written by the apostles to the churches. Okay? And in Rome, there was a Christian church. And Paul points out in verse 16, and 17, something that we really need to understand and to really grasp. Look what he says in verse 16. And this is Paul talking. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Two simple verses. Now that we've read them, now we're going to go back and dissect them. Paul is making a statement, okay? He's making a profound statement. He is saying something right up front to the church. For I, Paul, am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Then we got a semicolon there. We have to stop there and consider what he just said. What does Paul mean by not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ? He's proud to confess it. I'm sorry? He's proud to confess 
he's proud, he's not ashamed, so therefore, in a sense, you could say he could be proud to confess or to tell he's not embarrassed. Okay, so he's not ashamed. He's not embarrassed of the gospel of Christ. And why is that? Every question that I ask is found in the verse. That's why I stop at every punctuation that you see. And remember, I use the King James. All right? Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? We're going to get deeper into it to understand what the gospel of Christ is first. Well, Paul actually, in a sense, was not with Christ. He met Christ on the road to Damascus. But he was not with Christ in the sense of the other 12 apostles. All right? So there's a distinction. And he's making a very profound statement by saying, I'm not ashamed. But why not? And like I said, the answer is found in the next portion of that verse. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Here's the answer. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That's why not. Okay? He's not ashamed. And that's why he's writing to the church at Rome and then telling them hey guess what you can count me in <laughs> alright <laughs> to everyone for it is the power of God unto salvation listen carefully to what he said for it is the power of God unto salvation. So then, does that mean that everybody is going to get saved? It's either yes or no. Chester? Yes. No. How do I know? Look at the verse very carefully. See, this is the beauty of teaching. I can take all day on one verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is qualified. You have to do something. To everyone that believeth. There you go. To everyone that believeth. So therefore, it may, not everybody's going to get saved because not everybody is going to believe the gospel. All right? No matter how you present it, no matter how many times you witness to a person, some people will say, I don't want to hear it. Okay? So it is qualified. Paul knows. And that's why he says, to everyone that believes." So now he makes another point, and that point is, you have to believe. All right. But what is it that you have to believe? That's the beauty of teaching. Because now we're going to take time to break things down. What is it that we must believe? We've already been told at the beginning. The answer is at the beginning. I am not ashamed of the what? Bingo. We must believe the gospel. Okay? So now, if I was to ask you a question, and I am, and like I said, if you don't know the answer and you think you might know, go ahead and just throw it out there. That will tell me and also tell you how much you really know. And better still, or more importantly, how much it is that we don't know. 
that we should know as Christians that we say we are and if we've been saved for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years or 5 days we should know what the gospel is okay so he's making a statement like I said I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth okay what does the word believe mean what does it imply when you say you believe something what are you really saying Well, that goes along with it. But to believe something, you are saying this. You are trusting. When you say, I believe in Christ, you are saying that you trust Christ. So now that brings up another question. I say I believe. But then sometimes I might not know what I believe it. I might not know why I don't believe it. And if I don't know what the word means, how do I know I did it? If I don't know what the word believe means, and I say I believe in Christ, I'm not, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm saying if you in fact did trust Christ for your salvation, that's what you're saying. I am trusting Christ. Believe implies trust. If you say you believe, listen carefully, okay, and don't trust I've got news for you. You don't believe. All right? Basically, yes. Okay? If you say you believe, but don't trust, and we're talking about Christ, okay? Yeah, or anybody else for that matter. If I say, I'm going to let you have $10, and you say, I believe you. You're trusting me for that ten dollars until such time as you prove me wrong. You should trust me. Same thing applies with believing in Christ. We are trusting Him. Now that leads us to another question. See, I'm full of questions because that's how we learn. We learn by communicating, by talking to each other. But if I use words that you do not understand, what good am I doing you? Absolutely no good whatsoever. Okay? Whatsoever. Because I might be using words that are way above your head. And you say, what is he talking about? <laughs> I have no clue. And believe you me, I've been there. And I'd be the first one to raise my hand when they say, did you know this, Jose? No, I didn't. And a lot of people are afraid to admit they don't know. And that keeps them from really understanding the Word of God. And if I said to you this word and used it in this sentence, in this phrase, you all are ignorant in the word of God. What did I just say to you? You don't know. You don't know. But a lot of people say, you don't call me stupid. <laughs> I didn't call you stupid. I merely made a statement. If you are ignorant, that means you don't know the word of God. That's all that means. It's not a bad word. A lot of people think it is. Because they don't understand what the word means. Same thing works with the word of God. 
So Paul is saying that, okay, that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. He qualifies it and makes sure that everybody understands, hey, there's a requirement before you can claim salvation, and that is to believe, which then leads to trust, and then we must trust, but then I'm stuck. In Jose's mind, he says, wait a minute, what am I trusting? Better still, who am I trusting? I just don't trust anybody, okay? I have to be honest with you. So, who am I trusting? Let's start there. If I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who am I trusting? I just gave you the answer. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay? So, he says, to everyone that believeth, means to everyone that trusts. Okay, so what am I trusting? Whom am I trusting? Or who? Whichever word, you know, proper grammar. I failed English, okay? So I don't know. And I'm from Texas. That's even worse. All right. So, who am I trusting? Christ. What am I trusting him for? For my salvation. Okay. So let's figure this out. I'm trusting Christ for my salvation because I believe in him. All right. But how did he accomplish my salvation? That's a question that begs an answer. What am I trusting that Christ did for him to accomplish my salvation? See, as Christians, that should just go boom, 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 boom. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Death, burial, resurrection. For our sins. Precisely. That's what we're trusting. We're trusting, okay, that he died on the cross for us. We're trusting that he rose again on the third day, okay, that he was buried, that he rose again, all right? But see, other people died and rose again in the Bible. So what's the difference between Christ and say Lazarus, something that perhaps everybody knows that's in the Gospels. He was brought back to life, he died, he was buried, he rose again. But what's the difference between Lazarus and Christ? That's true. That's one. But the big difference. There is a big difference. Guess what? Lazarus died, buried, and Christ rose him from the dead. But guess what? He died again. Christ died, buried, rose again, is now sitting at the right hand of God. Big difference. He's not going to die again. Okay? So there's the big difference. So we must trust the things that he accomplished on the cross at Calvary for our salvation. All right. So now we continue on with verse 16. The end of it. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. To the Jew first. And you'll see a little comma. Stop and consider that. Before you go on, also to the Greek. All right. Christ was a Jew. 
he came for the Jewish people. That's why he says first. first. Okay? But if you go back into the Old Testament, you'll see that God, in his infinite wisdom, God the Father, made allowances for the rest of the people. <laughs> if you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile, or in this case here, he's, you are also called Greek. Also to the Greek. That includes us, okay? Because <laughs> we're not Jew. We're Gentile or Greek. So it's important to understand the gospel of Christ, okay? And that's why Paul makes this statement concerning the gospel of Christ. And now you think that's good. Look at verse 17. Remember where you came from. Verse 16. They're tied together. In this gospel of Christ, we're going to be told something very important. Look what it says. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. Wow. What's he saying to us? What is Paul saying to the church in Rome and to us today? For therein, therein what? For therein, not what, but where? Therein where? I'm sorry? The righteousness of God. Well, yes, but therein where is the righteousness of God revealed? We go back to verse 17. I mean 18, I'm sorry. My mistake. For therein, therein is referring to one word. Not yet. Okay, you're on the right track though. Therein where? I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It starts with a G and we've been talking about it since I started. It's got five letters instead of three. Verse 16, what does it say? For I am not ashamed of what? The gospel therein is making reference back to the gospel that he is talking about and writing about to the church in Rome. Therein, the gospel of Christ, okay, that Paul is not ashamed of, therein, therein what? Here's what. Is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith? Okay? In the gospel of Christ. All right? Paul is telling us what God is revealing to us. And what is he revealing to us? Somebody just said it a little while ago. Therein is God revealed is the what? The righteousness. Okay? In the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God 
the Father is revealed okay without the gospel we would not understand why Christ came <laughs> okay all right and it's revealed from faith to faith from start to finish in order for you to grasp it, in order for you to believe it, you must have faith. From beginning to end, what God reveals to us is what? Why do we believe it? That's the question. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So why do we believe what Paul is telling us? Because we have what? We have, well, we trust. That's true. But we need more than trust. We have to have faith. In order to trust, we must have faith. Without that, then you won't believe then you won't trust, then you're still lost. Bingo, okay? Because now look what he says. As it is written. All right? And look at, look at that. Four words. As it is written, comma. My question to me, if, if, if I sit down to read my Bible, and I was reading this verse as I am right now, the first thing that comes to my mind, and if you learn to study the Bible, okay, you must ask questions. Okay? And stop and consider what you just read. All right? As it is written, my first question would be, where is it written? That would be my first question. Because I'm being told by Paul, who I don't even know, okay? I know about him, but I never knew him, okay? Yet he is telling me something, for it is written. So where is it written? You're touching it. In the Word of God, in the Old Testament, and in the New I'm sorry? Was the Bible put together at this time or were they just scrolls? At this particular time, they were just scrolls. Okay? There was no such thing as a book. Okay? No. Not as we know it today. Let me rephrase that. Okay? <laughs> because they were letters and they, they were uh, on scrolls. And uh, it was not put together the way it is today. No. That came years later. Actually, the Bible that you have in your hand that has all the books has got chapters and verse numbers were not put together until about 500 years ago. Okay? Approximately. All right, it is written, it is written in the Old Testament. What is written in the Old Testament? That would be the next question because we're told it's written. What is written? And he's going to tell us. The just shall live by faith. Okay? The just shall live by faith. All right? So now... <laughs> Once again, comes another question. All right? Don't you just love this? I love this because as I teach you, I learn so much myself. It refreshes what I already know. Sometimes we tend to forget when you get my age. All right? So, here's my next question. What's faith? 
The just shall live by faith. What is faith? Someone you believe in. Well, someone you believe in is the person that you put your faith in. But that does not tell me what faith is. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Catch that. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. I'm sorry. I misquoted that. Let me go back and make sure. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 11, that is what's known as the Hall of Faith. Verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, remember, I have the King James. When you say it says, Now faith is the substance, with another better word is the assurance. We have the assurance when we have faith, okay, of things hoped for, and the evidence or the conviction of that assurance of things not seen. What the heck does that mean, Jose? Well, let's see. Were you there at the cross? No. Do you believe it? Yes. Then that requires faith that requires an assurance of things hoped for, the future of Christ coming back for us, and the evidence is the conviction. I am absolutely positive without a doubt that this event is going to happen, that he is going to come back for us. Okay, the conviction. I am fully convicted or I am fully convinced there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that what the Word of God is saying to us is true. That's assurance, that's conviction. Okay, so faith, without faith, That's the easy part. Now, look at chapter 11, okay? And let's not just stop there, okay? I'm going to ask you another question concerning faith. Let me ask you this question. Why is it so important to have faith? Hmm? According to the Bible, the Bible gives us the best reason we could ever have. Why is it so important to have faith? Look at verse 6. Keep going. Keep that's why it's so important to have faith. We'll look at this verse and we'll break it down real quick. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Who's Him? God. Okay, God the Father. Okay? For he that cometh to God must believe or trust that he is. That he is what? That he is what? Well, that's, that, that is true, okay? But what must we believe? For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is what? Precisely, okay? <laughs> because if you don't believe that he is God, then you're certainly not going to believe 
that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now here we have another qualification. Once again, the writer of the book of Hebrews makes a statement, a number of statements in verse 6. One of them is, for without faith it is impossible to please him. That's one statement. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That's another statement. And then he makes another statement, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now in this statement, he makes two. He is a rewarder, but guess what? The writer of Hebrews qualifies what he just got through saying about he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them. Don't stop there. He qualifies it by saying what? What must we do? Seek we must diligently seek him. And how do we do that? Read, read, his, word. read his word. Come to church. Come to Bible study. have meditations. I don't get rewarded very often. He says, oh wow, why not? I don't know. <laughs> you go to church? No. You're a Christian, right? Yes. You pray? No. Go to Bible study? No. Don't have time. Why not? I don't have time. But you expect God to be reward to reward you. Oh wow. Really? <laughs> no, we have to, his demands. He has put a commandment. It's not a request. Please seek me. No. Diligently seek me. Okay? This is why when I started, you know, we, we communicated with words. But if we don't understand what the word means, how can we do it? Diligently means is make time, take time, whatever. Do that you have to do in order to spend time with God. And if you don't, there could be a problem. Okay? There could be a problem. Verse 1 and verse 6 of the book of Hebrews tells us two things. Actually, it tells us a number of things. However, it focuses on faith, what faith is, and then how it is impossible to please God. Okay? Without faith. How can you approach God? Because without faith, you can't believe. Without believing, you don't trust. So if you don't trust, how can you approach God? When you don't know Him. You can't. Okay? And people wonder sometimes about that. They, they have a hard time understanding why things don't work out right. It's not... 1, 26, 59, 210. No, it's 1, 2, 3, 4. God says, you do this, I do this. <laughs> you know, we go back and forth. So, now let's go back to Romans. Okay, there was a little sidebar there, more or less. But it's important, because we're talking about faith in verse 17 of the book of Romans, okay, in chapter 1. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Saved. I'm sorry? Saved. Well, the just are those that believe. And you believe by faith. Okay, but the just are the saved. 
just is like saying justification. We have been justified in Christ, all right, which now gives us access to God. We can now talk to God. We're no longer enemies of God because of the justification. All right? So, now we get to the lesson. <laughs> that was just the opening. Now we go back to verse 16 again. The gospel of Christ, okay? When I ask what the gospel of Christ was, you answered correctly. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ. But we left something out. Very, very important. That's why I had to make the comment concerning Lazarus. Okay? What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Very good, Kevin. The good news. Okay? And what is the good news? He is risen. I'm sorry? He is risen. Well, that's true. Okay, that's true. That's part of the story. The gospel of Christ is the good news of his number one. Okay, you got to look at it in order. Of his coming, okay, the coming of Christ. Okay, that's part of the good news. So what is, why is it good news, the coming of Christ? Why is it good news? Because in his coming, he came for one purpose. And that is to provide what? Forgiveness of sins for all who believe. <laughs> okay? That's why it's called good news. Alright? Now, we're going to do a little walking through the Bible. Okay? Going to go to the book of Colossians. Okay. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. After, after Philippians or Ephesians, you have Colossians. Philippians, roughly the 12th book in the New Testament, okay? And look at 114. He provided, he came to provide forgiveness for our sins, okay? For those who believe, okay? So what does verse 14 say of chapter 1, Colossians? We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Oh, wow. So he came for a purpose, and his purpose was to provide forgiveness of sins for all who believe, qualified, okay? In whom, whom is Christ, we, that is us, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Wow. Now go back to Romans chapter 10. I always keep my book, my finger in Romans, all right? Chapter 10, okay? Chapter 10, and let's look at verse 9. <laughs> If we believe, remember what we just got through reading in Colossians. Now look at verse 9. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart 
that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be what? Saved. Saved. Oh, wow. Okay? He came to provide forgiveness for our sins for all who believe. You know. Ever since the first man sinned, Adam and Eve, okay? Everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve. All right. Adam and Eve, well, it, uh, actually, you know, we, we blame the woman, okay? And rightly so. But Adam is not without guilt, okay? For the simple reason, see, who did God tell not to eat of the fruit of good and evil? Adam, he did not tell Eve. Okay? Eve was the one that ate. But it was Adam's responsibility to inform his wife. So he didn't even tell her. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. But see, everybody says, Eve did this and Eve did That's true. She came and said, hey, guess what? This guy says, don't believe God, eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil. And I did. And guess what? Here, you eat. Now Adam had been told by God, don't do this. God told him specifically, don't, because when you do, you shall surely die. Okay, Adam had to make a choice. Do I obey my wife? Or do I obey God? Guess what? He made the wrong choice. So Adam is not without fault. Okay? And actually, and this is my personal opinion, okay? He's guiltier than Eve. Because he knew. God had told him specifically and he disobeyed God. Right. All right? Eve, you know, you can make excuses because that's what they did when God said, hey, what happened? I the serpent, the assumed. wife, blah, blah, blah. I just assumed that if he told Adam, that Adam told her. You, you would think, right? Of such an important thing that you would tell your wife, hey, guess what? Look, God told us not to do this, okay? You know, because at the time that he told Adam, guess what? Eve was not around. Okay? She had not been made yet by God. Okay? So, okay? We are under the condemnation of God. Okay? Go to Romans 5.12. Okay? We are under the condemnation because of what happened. Romans 5.12 Let's see 5.12 Oh wow Look what I've been talking about Chapter 5 verse 12 Wherefore As by one man Adam Sin entered into the world And death by sin and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See? The Bible does not tell by one woman. Huh? By one man. He had been given the responsibility. Adam was the head. Just like we should be today. Alright? Adam was given the responsibility. Okay, was given the authority, but with authority, guess what? Comes great responsibility. All right? And the first thing that she should have done after Eve was created was to tell her, hey, we're not supposed to do this. That was no. pretty much the only rule, wasn't it? I'm sorry? That was pretty 
much the only rule that he That was the only rule. He says, you've got everything. I've provided everything for you. I only have one thing that you must not do. And you must not do this. And he spelled it out and he told him the consequences of that. In doing so, what did they do? They committed sin. Okay? So what is sin? After we've had this conversation concerning Adam and Eve. God told them not to do something. They did it. They sinned. So therefore, the definition of sin is what? Well, it's death. That's the consequence of sin. But what is sin? See? Well, that's the question. What's sin? What did they do? So therefore, sin is what? Take away disobey and make a larger word using the same word, disobedience. Sin is disobedience against God. That's what sin is. People don't know that. Okay? They really don't. Sin is disobedience. You've disobeyed God. Therefore, he says the consequence is, is death. Because everybody breaks God's law, okay? Perfect law by committing sin. Where does it tell us? Back it up to Romans 3, 23. Hmm? Sin. The first man's sin, mankind has been under the condemnation of God. Okay? We found that out. And because everyone breaks God's perfect law by committing sin, look at verse 23, Romans 3.23. Am I making this up? No. Look what the word says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? There's no question. With God, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And everyone is guilty. Okay? Now, go forward to 5, Romans chapter 5. All right? Everyone is guilty, okay? Look at verse 18. Therefore, as of by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, to condemnation. That one was Adam. Okay? That offense was disobedience to God, sin. So, what's the end result? Of, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. You, we've been condemned to death, okay? By God. Because of sin. Even so, Here's the good part, okay? There's always a positive and a negative. All right? Watch this. Here's the bad part. We'll read verse 18 again. Therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. You got a punctuation there. Read it, consider it. Then if you go on, look what it says now. Here comes the good part. Even so, okay? Even though we've been condemned, by the sin of one man, we're under condemnation of death. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And who was that one man? Who's, even so, the righteousness of the one. Who was the one? Christ. One man messed up, Adam. God took care of it. His, God took care of it. You're right. Okay? Alright? That's what it, we're being told here. Okay? And remember, condemnation. Now, go forward 
to Romans 6, 23. The punishment for the crime of sin is physical death. All right? Physical death. Make sure you catch the word physical. All right? Romans 6, 23. We should know that by heart. Okay? 6, 23 says what? For the wages of sin is death. That's the bad part. Oh, wow, we're in trouble, guys. Okay? Now comes this little three-letter word that changes from a negative for the wages of sin is death to a positive. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, wow. There is physical death for the crime of sinning against God. Okay? And you say, well, God said to Adam that if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Well, did he die? Immediately? No. He lived and lived and lived and lived for a long, long, long time. And if I told you how long he lived, you probably wouldn't believe it. Okay? But he lived over 800 years after he was kicked out of the garden. Okay? He was, he was talking about spiritual death. The relationship between God and Adam was dissolved at the moment that they ate of the fruit, okay? It was spiritual death, okay? And the death that he's talking about, go to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelations, okay? All the way back to the chapter 20, okay? Chapter 20, what kind of death are we talking about? It's a spiritual death and the condemnation that the lost are in. What is that condemnation? Chapter 20, look at verse 15. Look what it says. This is the Apostle John. Right in the book of Revelations, the information is given to him by an angel that Christ gave to the angel to give to John the Apostle, the last one living. Look what it says. And whosoever, that's a key word, was not found written in the book of life, was what? Cast into the lake of fire. That is a literal hell. Yeah. Okay? For whosoever, it doesn't make a difference whether you're rich, poor, short, tall, good looking, ugly, it don't matter. If your name is not written in the book of Lamb's of Life, you are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Luckily, now that's the second death, right? That it, yes, there there's three kinds of death. There's physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death, eternal separation from God. And death always involves separation. Physical death takes the soul the spirit out of the body, okay? Spiritual death is when God said to Adam, hey, get out of here, you're, you're lost. And then the eternal separation, when you're into the uh, lake of fire, you have absolutely no more chance. You're done. Okay? Three deaths. Okay? Eternal separation. 
from God. Okay. Look at chapter 20 again at our book of Revelations. And we're going to look at two verses here. Find them. Well, actually, we already read 15, okay, but we should have read 14. Look what it says there. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay. I'm like, duh, it was right. <laughs> but see, it's good that you ask questions. See? And there's nothing wrong with asking a question. Because that's how you learn. That's how you learn, by asking questions. Because you might think one thing, and when you ask a question and somebody answers it, you say, oh, wow, I didn't know that. So hell as it is right now is not a lake of fire. That after Jesus comes, Satan and hell is cast into the second death in the lake of fire. Okay. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Because you made a couple of statements that are true, and then there's a couple of statements that are not true. So I can't tell you yes for the whole for the whole thing. Death was created. I mean not death, but hell was created for Satan and his angels. Okay? And people say you're going to go to hell when you die. You don't. Not immediately. Okay? And I must qualify of what I'm going to say. Okay? When you die, if you are saved, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? That's a saved person. Well, what about the lost person? Well, if you know the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus was taken by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. Paradise. Today, heaven. Okay? The rich man was taken to the place of torment. Not hell. No. But it is a place of torment that you don't want to be in. Okay, if you read the story in chapter 19 of the book of Luke, you'll see the whole story there. All right? And, uh, yes, I believe, let me make sure because I'm, I don't want to give you a false reference here. I'm just taking it off my mind. Was he the one that uh, asked God to, uh, if he could go back and warn his... Yes, the rich man, yes, he had rich his brothers. Why? Because he was in a place of torment. He says, you know, go touch the finger with some water and put it in my tongue. He says, and then he says, if you can't do that, then send someone to, to, uh, yeah, yes. But it's not uh, chapter 17. It is actually uh, Luke chapter 18. Okay. I'm sorry I did not hear you. He was on torment, yeah. The, 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 uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Here. Back it up. It's 16. Luke 16. Okay, started at verse 19. Starting at verse 19 in the, the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. You'll see the story, and you'll, when he says that he took him into Abraham's bosom, that is considered uh, paradise. And the place of torment is not the hell or the lake of fire that is spoken of in the book of Revelations. Okay? 
So. So that doesn't actually happen until Christ comes. Until Christ comes back. Okay. All right. So you, you know, yes, they go to a place of torment, but that's not hell. Okay. Sometimes we uh, have good intentions, but sometimes we say the wrong things. Or somebody told us the wrong things, and then we repeated them. <laughs> so, now, the bad news that all are guilty of sin, okay? That's the bad news, all right? And we're condemned by God, okay? But that condemnation is what? Now, he says, okay, you've been condemned to death, but now I'm going to do, put a counterweight. You're down here, now I'm going to put a counterweight and bring you back up with the gospel, the good news of Christ. Okay? That's what God did for us, all right? His grace, okay? His mercy, his compassion, His love for us. All right? Allowed God the Father to send His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? He made a way for man to be forgiven or for us, man, woman, of our sins. And how do I know that? Go to the book of John. How did he make a way? Book of John, back it up. This is the first verse that I memorized way back when. I got saved back in 1980, okay? I had no idea what I had done other than knowing that I was a sinner and that I needed salvation, but I was ignorant of the Word of God. How did God make a way for our... Look at verse... 3? 16. 16. Okay. His love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, once again, there's that word. We've heard that word before. Whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like. Believeth in him, trust in what he did on the cross for us, should not perish. Okay. And guess what? There's that three-letter word again. Should not perish is a negative. You're going to die, buddy. We're all going to die physically. Okay? But, because of our faith and trust, whosoever believeth in him, him being Jesus Christ, we're going to have what? Ever lasting life, or life that lasts forever, <laughs> okay? <laughs> life that lasts forever, okay? And it's important that we know that, okay? God sent His Son, okay, to take the sins of the whole world, okay? And through His death, on the cross, Christ's death on the cross, okay? Now go to First Peter, back toward the end of the Bible. First Peter. We're going to find something very interesting. Chapter 2. Okay. God made sure that all who believe in the name of Christ will be forgiven. Okay? Through his death on the cross, 1 Peter 
chapter 2 and verse 24. What does it say? Wait a minute here. Oops, we flipped the, the page here too quick. Look what it says in verse 24 of First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Everybody there? Look what, look what it says. First Peter was an apostle of Christ, okay? He wrote this particular book who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Hmm? But we got to make sure we know who he's talking about. Who in his own body bore our sins. Who is he talking about? He doesn't give a name. Jesus. Jesus. Who in his own body bore our sins. He is the only one that was able to and qualified to be able to bear the sins. And he was the only one qualified, sinless. The God the Father demanded a perfect sacrifice, okay, in his own body on the tree. What tree? I thought he was crucified on a cross. Was a tree, <laughs> right? Before it became a cross. I mean, this is to me, and please understand, I've been teaching for 34 years. It's just common sense, like, you know, you, you, you figure it out, on a tree. Well, it wasn't a tree, what are you talking about? No, it's on a cross. Well, what did the cross made out of back then, okay? A tree. <laughs> And it was not, you know, smooth like that table. Okay? No way. All right? So, God the Father sent down His Son, Jesus Christ, for Him to pay the penalty for our sins. Okay? And in doing so, okay, He made sure, okay, that those who believe in the name of Christ Jesus will be forgiven. How do you know that? Go to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts and we'll find out how I know that. Because see, I'm not making this up. I'm just leading you to these verses that tell you these things that we might not know. Acts chapter 10 Okay. In verse 43. Okay. God made a way for us to be forgiven as long as we believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. Look at verse 43 of the book of Acts chapter 10. To him, there's a key word, okay, that's a personal pronoun that identifies someone. Give all the prophets witness that through his name, that's another key as to who this person is being identified. Whosoever believeth in him, there's another one, shall receive remission or forgiveness of sins. So who is he talking about? To him, who's him? Jesus. Right. Whosoever believes in him, who's him? Jesus. <laughs> Same one. Okay? To him give all the prophets witness that through his name What's his name? Jesus. What's his last name? Anybody know? If you know, let me know, because I don't. Okay? 
And when I ask that question, sometimes people will say, Christ. I said, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not Christ. Christ is not a last name. Christ is a title, meaning the Messiah, the Anointed One, chosen by God the Father to be able to come down, to be able to be the final sacrifice that God demanded payment for our sins. Okay? Christ is a title, not a last name. All right? So he was given that. Okay? And now Jesus' resurrection, okay, guarantees the justification. We have been made right or just with God those to all of those who believe. Go to Romans. Remember, I told you, keep your finger in Romans. Chapter 4. All right. Chapter 4. And let's look at the last verse of chapter 4. Now, what I'm doing, I'm directing you to certain verses because I'm teaching a certain subject. But you'll see that this is the end of chapter 5. So when you read the word who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, keep in mind that Paul writing chapter 5 has put 24 other verses in front of 25. So if you say, well, who's he talking about? If you go back and read chapter 5, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 24, you'll find out. Because then he, that's why he, he doesn't use Jesus. He uses the pronoun, who. All right? Who. So who's who? Jesus. Who was what? Delivered for our offenses. Okay? Who was delivered for our offenses. Okay? So now let's look at this verse carefully. Who we know is Christ, Jesus. All right? He was delivered. Delivered to who? What happened to him prior to his crucifixion? He was arrested, falsely accused three different times before Pilate, before the Sanhedrin, back and forth. That's what it means there. He was delivered to all these people. And then he was found guilty for what? For something he didn't do. All right? For our offenses, all right? He was delivered where? The end result was where? The cross. He was delivered to the cross for our offenses. To the grave. You have to follow the whole scenario from the time that he was arrested all the way through his resurrection. This is what this verse is talking about and was raised again, see, for our justification. Justified, our justification. For our justification, we have been justified before Christ, by, by Christ before God, the Father. And now we have access to the Father before we did not, okay? But because of what? God the Father had laid out long before the creation of the world. <laughs> All right. Uh, he had made arrangements. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. <laughs> All right. So he said, now I, I know I'm going to have a problem after what I do. Okay, now he had a choice to make. What do I do? See, 
as a teacher, I look at things sometimes differently. I say, well, you could have made them robots. Right? Yeah, and he says, I'll push this button and you do this. And if I don't want you to do that, I'll push this button. But no, God said, no, I don't want that. I want a creation that is going to obey me, not because I make him, but because he loves me. All right? He gave us a free will to choose. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. Okay? And we say, well, wait a minute. How come we get blamed because of Adam and Eve? Well, let me ask you this. Is Adam and Eve at fault for your bad thoughts? At fault for what? For your bad thoughts? For the way we act sometimes? For the words we use sometimes? No. They're not around. We can't blame them. <laughs> he said, well, God blames us for Adam and Eve's sins. Yes and no. We're responsible for ourselves. The sins we commit. Well, I don't commit any sins. We have that choice. Right. We make that choice. And not only do we make a choice of... See, there's, people only think of com sins of commission. Sins we commit. Their sense of omission. Omission meaning if we know to do right and don't do it, that's a sin. We're told that by James. See? I don't commit any sins, really. You just lied. <laughs> People say you're crazy, Jose. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts, and sometimes we need to hear the truth. And that is how I'm going to end. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30, with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.